Hello again, and a warm welcome to this special series of the Hive podcast, featuring the interviews from my new book, Business Unusual, Values, Uncertainty, and the Psychology of Brand Resilience. Join me, Natalie Nahai, and some very special guests as we explore the ideas transforming the world of business, brands, and beyond. For more information and resources on today's episode, please visit natalinahai.com forward slash the Hive podcast. And for more information around the book, please visit businessunusualthebook.com. Thanks for listening, and I hope you enjoy the show. Throughout this season, we've been hearing from people whose ideas are transforming the way we work, rest and play. One thing we've looked at is how businesses can be more pioneering, inviting and inclusive. And the past two years have shown us that we have the opportunity to redefine how work works for everyone. That's why I am thrilled to tell you about Forward, a one-day digital summit powered by Plio. Plio is a business spending solution, but it's not just about expenses, receipts and invoices for them. They also have a unique vision to make everyone feel valued at work. That's just one of the topics I'm excited to be exploring at Forward, which I'm very pleased to say I will be hosting. Join me online on December the 9th for stimulating conversations and debates with founders and leaders from companies like Airbnb, Netflix, Spotify and Zendesk. Plus, keynotes from the likes of Kim Scott, the best-selling author of Radical Candor. The world of work is evolving. Don't get left behind. Get your free ticket for Forward today at plio.io forward slash en forward slash forward. That's plio.io forward slash en forward slash forward. I look forward to seeing you there. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with another friend of the podcast, Dr. Gillian Isaacs-Russell, a celebrated author, psychoanalyst and psychotherapist, member of the British Psychoanalytic Council, the British Psychotherapy Foundation, the American Psychoanalytic Association and the International Psychoanalytic Association. Gillian is a registered psychotherapist in the state of Colorado and has been in private practice in the UK and USA since 1988. Her fascinating book, Screen Relations, The Limits of Computer-Mediated Psychoanalysis and Psychotherapy, examines how some of our most intimate relationships, including that of analyst and patient, are affected by technologically mediated communication. Having served on the editorial board as book reviews editor, Gillian currently serves on the COVID-19 advisory team for the American Psychoanalytic Association, where she received the 2021 Distinguished Service Award. Gillian, thank you so much for joining me again in conversation on The Hive. It's lovely to talk with you. I've missed you. It's always wonderful when the two of us get together and and think together. Thank you. Well, the feeling is very much mutual. Um, And I'm very excited to dive in and get a take on how you might begin to answer this question, which is the one that I think you've already answered, but I'm going to ask it again. Given where we are right now, and we're recording this in mid-February, What do you think is currently happening in the global human psyche, if we use that frame? That's a really good question. I think we can think about it a bit in terms of disaster psychology. Hmm. And when you look at a graph, there is a change in the way that people respond to disaster. And I think we can think of the pandemic as an ongoing trauma Hmm. In that, in the beginning, there's a big uptick in the graph where everybody gathers together and there's a a great feeling of we can do it and a feeling of wanting to help and to participate. There's a lot of energy and that is reflected in perhaps in different countries in everyone singing from their balconies together, (laughs) in people um, hooting horns and banging pots and pans when there's a shift change, the 7 p.m. shift change for the first responders and hospitals. You know, there was that enormous kind of energy. And for me, that happened. um, I was 
asked to join the American Psychoanalytic Association's COVID-19 advisory team mm. because of my previous experience working with technology and treatment. And so we got very active in creating worldwide peer groups for clinicians and support for the public who had questions about what was happening psychologically for them, various other projects. So there was that great rush. And what happens after that rush is a huge swoop down into a feeling of disillusionment, of despair, of despondency. And it may be different in different places, but certainly I think right now for us here in the US, even with the rollout of the vaccine, even with hope that things are going to change, we probably are at the bottom uh, feeling like we have dealt with about a year mm. of lockdown and of uncertainty. And so hopefully from there, the way that we deal with trauma is to make meaning, to understand what's happened to us and slowly to rebuild. So I think that's probably where we are now. Mm. As a person in one of the peer groups that I facilitate said, I didn't sign up for this when I trained to become a psychotherapist. And how do I know that you're not just all virtual avatars that I'm looking at <laughs> because we're all on Zoom? Mm. <laughs> That's such a tricky question to answer as well because you do get into this weird space where everything feels quite flat. Yes. And I know you were interested in, in the idea of resilience. And I think that this is something that's been... Um, a, a tremendous challenge for all of us because one of the things that helps people to be resilient is being part of a community mm. and um, to be able to feel that you have traditions, cultural traditions, faith traditions, takes a village traditions working as a community together. And when you think of the Blitz spirit mm. in the UK during the war, that that was possible because you could work in a community. But we've all been in a particular kind of isolation since the beginning of the pandemic, which has made being resilient very challenging. Mm. It's interesting to that point about community. I've started reading a book called The Power of Ritual by Caspar Tekul, who is someone who works at the Harvard Divinity mm. School. It's a really interesting book. I'm really blazing my way through it. It's quite unlike books for me. I'm usually quite slow. And one of the things that he talks about is how, at this point in time, we've come to internalise this sense that rather than depend on our community in the village to scaffold and support us and nourish and help us, that we somehow have to do that entirely for ourselves within mm -hmm. the constructs of our own minds, with you know, whatever self-help apparatus mm -hmm. you want to um, to develop or build upon or whatever. And it's so interesting to, to think of it in that way, that the loss of community, the loss of ritual and the turning inward, especially when we're more disconnected than ever, how isolating that can be and how difficult it can be because we haven't socially evolved to be separate. And I don't think we will be mm. <laughs> socially evolving to be separate. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a challenge. And I think the only way to um, meet it is to be aware that this is something that we're lacking. And that means that we end up grieving, mm. grieving the loss. Mm. You know, a lot of resilience comes from childhood experience and uh, the feeling that at one point in one's development, one had a stable and committed relationship with a supportive parent or, or caregiver. And also, I think there's a biological component to it too. Mm. So people are set up to deal with this uh, worldwide trauma, this ongoing strain trauma in different ways already, perhaps biologically and from nurture. So it is, it's a tremendous challenge. And I think that we've found that there's a parallel mental health pandemic mm. along with the viral pandemic uh, and that people are working harder than ever um, in my field to meet the needs of the general population. Mm. And actually this mass migration to virtual interaction, you know, as you've mentioned, it connects to our sense of mental health and well-being. What do you think we've lost from no longer being able to communicate and physically touch and be in person? So I'm thinking here about some of the fascinating pieces you've written about sense of presence. Mm. What is it and why is it important? Right. Well, just to say, first of all, that 
the virtual interaction that we've had to use, that we've had no choice about during the pandemic, has been in that way a blessing. It's a blessing that we do have the technology, Mm -hmm. that we have some way of being able to continue um, our communications with our loved ones, with our intimates, and also, in my case, to be able to work with my patients. So there is a tremendous positive in having technology. But it is true that it is not a functionally equivalent experience to be relating to someone through the screen or through the phone. And what we lose is that we're wired to relate in an embodied way. In fact, I think maybe we've talked about this when we've spoken before, but 65% or more of our communication is nonverbal. And there's no way that this can be captured on a screen, on a two-dimensional screen. So what we're losing by losing touch, by losing being able to be in the same room, is a tremendous amount of communication. The communication is paler. It's more anemic than it would be if we were together in person. When communication via technology works, it's because we have an illusion that we're present with each other. And that's called telepresence. So being present, you were asking about the actual experience of being present, that's a core neuropsychological phenomenon. And that stems from an organism's capacity, and that's any organism, not just human beings, to locate itself in an an external world according to the action that you can do in it to impact it. And people experience presence if they're able to act out in an external world and successfully transform their intentions into actions. Mm. So it's not the same thing as emotional engagement. Presence isn't the same thing as absorption or the degree of technological immersion. Uh, And for humans, these actions specifically include the person's capacity or even potential capacity to interact with another person in a shared external environment. Mm. So as a patient once said to me, when you share a physical space there's always the potential to touch, even if you don't, even if you don't act out, whether that means kicking or kissing. (laughs) So the sense of presence enables the nervous system to recognize that, that one's in an environment that's outside oneself and not just a product of your inner world like dreaming. Mm. So to make technology work, we have to have this illusion that what's going on between us isn't mediated. And the illusion is is achieved when you experience temporally appropriate feedback. For instance, when we're talking right now, as I'm talking to you and you're talking to me, and there's an immediate temporally appropriate feedback, it may be that the fact that I have earphones on, that I'm looking at the screen at Zencaster, which is telling me that the recording is in progress, that that falls away and that I'm imagining your face, that I'm feeling like we're in the same room talking to each other. But that, according to the people who do research in human-computer interaction, that can't be maintained all the time. Mm. There are things that interfere always when you're using technology that means that the illusion that we're together, that we have a sense of presence, gets shattered, it falls away and needs to be re-established as we go along. Mm. It's fascinating what you described there as well about the the possibility to reach out or to enact change in our physical environment. And I think it was through one of your papers, actually, that I read about these UCLA neurophysicists that found space mapping neurons in the brain and how they react differently to virtual reality than they do if we're in real world environments, rat studies. And so I wonder when we're no longer able to reach out or even potentially reach out to another person in physical space, Mm. what might that mean for the quality of the relationships that we then engage in and specifically for things like our sense of psychological safety? Well, I think that uh, the huge change is that we all get responsible for our own safety because we're in different environments. Mm. The traditional way, for instance, that a psychotherapist, psychologist, Uh, provides safety for their patients is that they provide the environment. The patient comes to the office, to the consulting room, and we can no longer do that. 
So um, people are all separate in their own environments. And not everyone is as well equipped to provide safety. That means even um, your cat coming into the room (laughs) or uh, somebody interrupting, hearing noises from the outside, being distracted. It's much more difficult to provide that kind of safety when you're in different environments. And you also wrote recently that eliminating being bodies together largely confines the therapeutic process to states of mind versus states of being. That's such a beautiful Mm. turn of phrase. Can you explain a little bit more about what this is and how this influences us? Yes. Uh, I can't take um, credit for that phrase. That's uh, from my (laughs) dear friend, a wonderful uh, British psychoanalyst, Michael Parsons. Mm -hmm. Um, He wasn't, in fact, talking about technology, but what he was talking about is that you can't um, eliminate or forget nonverbal, embodied communication, implicit communication. Even when you're together in the consulting room, it shouldn't resort to completely verbal. We don't just pay attention to the verbal. Mm-hmm. And so, as Damasio said, we're embodied, we're not simply embrained. <laughs> and that means that we perceive and communicate through our our whole body, not just through our words, our verbal explicit communication, and not just through what goes on in our mind. So we need to communicate with human beings from our state of being, from our entire body, and not just from a verbal or a thinking place. And to know that that is, even though it's implicit, even though we may not know what's happening non-verbally between us and another person, that is extremely important to feel a full and sort of vibrant uh, communication. I think what's happened, the challenge for us, is trying to recreate something of that Mm. um, through our virtual interactions. And the best that we've come up with thinking about this during the pandemic is engaging in a sort of waltz. And the waltz is that at times, it's a sort of paradox, you're having the illusion of a sense of presence. It's as if you are speaking directly with someone, that the screen, that the phone, whatever is mediating your communication falls away and it's as if you're in the same room. Mm. But that is always stopping. It's always being interrupted. And the other side of the paradox in this waltz is to waltz to an observation that telepresence has fallen away. And to be able to talk about it, to be able to put it into words. So for instance, if I'm working with a patient and um, the screen becomes very pixelated and I can't see them or I lose the communication verbally, I can't hear them. Research shows that what we tend to do is plow ahead, that we ignore those interruptions because what's more important than anything is keeping the connection. But in fact, in order to really work with working via technology, we have to actually out loud notice that something different has happened. Mm -hmm. So to notice that as you were saying that, I didn't hear the last bit of your sentence Mm. or I can't quite see your face. It's very pixelated at the moment, but you look very sad. Mm. Is that what I'm perceiving? You know, sort of curiosity and humility and, and noticing that the technology is there. So that if you can do this sort of paradoxical waltz between letting the technology disappear and noticing when it interferes, I think that it can somehow anchor a kind of communal experience between you and the people or person you're communicating with. Mm. And of course, one of the other issues that we butt up against time and again, especially with the technologies that we now have, because we use them for everything, is the problem of continuous partial attention. Yes. So can you describe a little bit what that is and how how that can get in the way? Because there's a lot of these stumbling blocks that are kind of just, you know, if you know about it, then you can, as you mentioned, create more of a communal discussion and, and approach around it. I think that's right. Knowing about it is the key. So continuous partial attention was noticed and described by someone named Linda Stone. And it's a kind of distraction, a state where you're hypervigilant, anticipating potential connection from all sorts of sources, always on, anywhere. And and so you're so accessible that in a sense, you're inaccessible. 
And that happens, for instance, because your computer contains all sorts of ways that you communicate. Email, program windows pop up. Um, you may have a phone on your desk at the same time that you're communicating with someone, set on silent, but available for a glance if, if texts come in. So you're always attending to many, many different sources of communication. And that does mean that the potential for the mediation to drop away is reduced. In fact, it's been found that the mere presence of a mobile phone on a nearby table, even if it's turned off or turned face down, can lessen the quality of a co-present conversation. It lowers levels of affinity and trust and empathy between participants, especially if they already have a close relationship. Mm. So what we found in facing the pandemic and having to take our entire practices online is that you have to take practical measures to deal with that kind of continuous partial attention, that kind of distraction. And so we give guidelines to patients. Todd Essig and I wrote a series of guidelines which are available on the American Psychoanalytic Association's website. When you begin to work remotely, and one of the things that we suggest is that you turn off or put to sleep all devices other than the one you're using to make the call, including watches, mm. uh, laptops, other phones. And if you use a smartphone or a computer, do your best to quit all programs other than the one you're using mm. and turn off all notifications. So there are practical things you can do, but that still doesn't stop your mind from knowing that that computer on which you're communicating, you might also use for shopping or in some cases for watching films. Some people might use it for porn or other things that intrude in a sort of semi-conscious way. Mm. It's so interesting. Actually, when I, I sit and read every morning, it's kind of a habit I've tried to build into my day. Mm. And it's a really enjoyable ritual. And I found that the only way that I can read peacefully and not be distracted is actually to hide my phone from view. Yes. Because if it's visually there, just as you've described... It, I glance at yes. it. I notice myself glancing at it. And it doesn't matter the, the, with the best intention and will in the world. I, I am so hardwired now, conditioned, <laughs> if you like, to, to look to it for rewards and distraction. And so I have to literally get it out of my sight so the affordance just doesn't come into play. It's, um, it's quite a remarkable thing to have that exert such a, a huge power. Yes, yes. And, and something that only a couple of decades ago wouldn't have been an issue. Mm -hmm. So another thing that I think is, is important to note now that we're sort of talking in this domain of how we deal with technology's difficulties and challenges, of course, video conferencing platforms have been such a boon in this time, especially for keeping in touch with family mm -hmm. or with work colleagues. But seeing ourselves reflected back on the screen, which I'm sure we're all familiar with, especially in that little self view, I don't know about you, but it makes me so self-conscious and distracted mm -hmm. and less able to mm -hmm. offer my full attention that I actually just, unless I'm doing a, a professional presentation, in which case I need to see if I'm being positioned correctly in the screen, the rest of it, I usually just switch mm -hmm. off I, or I hide the self-view. Mm -hmm. What do you think happens to the quality of our communication or relationship or interaction when we're self-surveilling or self-monitoring in that mm -hmm. way? I have the same experience as you. I know other people have told me that they like to be able to check out what they're communicating or how they're communicating by seeing themselves. But for me, it's extremely intrusive. I do turn my own view off if I can, and I ask my patients to do the same mm. because it splits your attention. Again, it makes you, in a really unnatural way, aware of your face mm -hmm. and uh, your appearance when what you really want to be doing is concentrating on the communication with the other person. I personally feel that that does interfere with the experience of telepresence, the experience of being able to communicate with someone uh, for with the illusion of being in the same room. That is a reminder that we're not in the same room and that I'm on a camera. So I agree with you. Although now many thousands of people that we've talked to in our role with the COVID-19 advisory team since the beginning of the pandemic, there are people who say they, they like it and that it makes them uh, more aware of how they're performatively communicating. Mm. That, that isn't the case for me. 
Mm. And I think the key word there is is the performance. Performance, I think if it's something yeah. which you're doing in order to convey something <laughs> yes. intentionally, then I imagine it could be a useful tool. But otherwise, it can get in the way because mm. it takes you out of flow. If you're yes. constantly, it's like you wouldn't talk to someone by looking at yourself in the mirror. It's just <laughs> exactly, <laughs> and it's basically a similar effect to that. Exactly. So. I'm curious from your perspective, obviously we're talking about relationships and your experience uh, in a therapeutic context, but if I were to ask you how you think, for instance, business leaders might better engage with their workforce or people who continue to work remotely if we are using these technologies moving forward, and I think it's it's probably a fair assumption that we're going to have at least some sort of blended version of how we work in the future. What are some of the tips or advice you might give them to help support their employees to be engaged and to to form relationships where there is greater psychological safety? I think, firstly, the key is the word you use, blended, Mm -hmm. that it's very important to know that one sense of the other's physicality and the embodied presence needs to be refreshed. So while it may be convenient to work from home in a uh, mediated way some of the time. It's extremely important to get teams, to get employees, to get people who work together, together in person from time to time. You know, it was much before the pandemic that uh, I think it was Yahoo decided that they needed to tell people to come in in person Mm -hmm. because the way that the teams of people work together were um, not as effective, not as creative, not as efficient and productive if they were all working from home. So blended is, I think, a hybrid kind of approach is what it's going to have to be. Back in 1998, Uh, Rocco did a a study which showed that trust breaks down in electronic contexts, but can be repaired by some initial face-to-face contact. Mm. And so I think that even something both simple and essential as trust needs to be promoted for people working together by having face-to-face meetings from time to time. Psychological safety is a word that you used, and I know that that's a very specific concept in business in terms of knowing that you're not going to be punished or humiliated for speaking up with ideas and questions or concerns or making mistakes. Mm -hmm. And for me in the psychological field, uh, that's an incredibly important thing to build into business because it actually springs from the idea that you can't play as a child, unless you feel you're in a safe environment. Mm. And play, if you think about Winnicott, is what leads to creativity and the use of imagination, which I would assume all businesses would want to encourage in their employees, because it means that somebody becomes trustworthy, creative, confident, and, and productive. So again, I think in order to produce an atmosphere of psychological safety, one needs to be able to meet in person. I don't know if you saw, it was an interesting BBC article, um, which I read online, about team building and that virtual team building is not very successful. It's really difficult. Hmm. Um, That people don't have a special environment where they have a day off to be sharing together something different, which is part of the idea of those team building days, retreats and exercises. What it means now is that they actually spend more time on the computer and experience Zoom fatigue. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think the other thing to look at with that is, you know, there's, there's that really common exercise that people do to mm-hmm. build trust where somebody falls backwards mm-hmm. and the group catches them. And of course, that isn't physically possible when you're online. There is no risk online. Mm -hmm. Um, And if there's no potentiality to be dropped, then you can't truly be held. Mm -hmm. So again, I think that when things are safe again, when it's safe to come back to work, that whereas there may be for convenience times that people will work from home in a mediated way, that coming back together as a community is essential for I think, a safe, um, productive business practice. Mm. That's such a beautiful way of looking at it as well, about the potential to be held if we Mm. take the risk to fall. So I wonder 
Is there a question that you think it would serve people in business, whether as employees or leaders, to ask themselves as we start to rebuild our way out of this pandemic? I think the question needs to be, how did it actually feel? Or how does it actually feel when people are not able to be together? And I would say that in my experience of talking to people in my field, there are very, very few people who don't mourn the loss of being in the presence of other people. Mm -hmm. And that those messy, kind of spontaneous, uh, uh, full communications when we're embodied in a shared environment uh, must be protected because it is the way that we're wired to operate and we're not going to evolve in some way to lose that. So to consider that people working together in safe teams need to feel um, that they can get the measure of the other person, truly get the measure of them by being in the room with them, that that's something that we've learned to celebrate and to treasure during the pandemic and to mourn the loss of, we hope, temporarily. Mm. Mm. So I'd like to ask another slightly more open question, like the first one, and that's what kind of world would you like to build? <laughs> I think you, asked, you may have asked me that last time at the beginning of the pandemic. I'm sure <laughs> I did. <laughs> I'm still working on it. Um, uh, I think, what kind of a world would I like to build? Um, I think a world in which we all can value the importance of the other, of other human beings, of community, of the reality of being able to actually take someone's hand rather than imagining that you're going to do do so. Mm. Um, I understand that with the enormous immersion into the use of technology during the pandemic, that people will have become more proficient, that they may feel that it's easier to stay at home and not commute, not waste the time uh, getting to somewhere. But the positives of being together are also very important. And I don't think there's anyone that I've talked to who hasn't been mourning the loss of being able to be together in families, in, in communal groups. And I think that goes for work as well. Something very important about leaving home for work in the morning, even if, as it is for me, it's just walking across a courtyard to another building. Um, that kind of time that we spend in movement, thinking and um, preparing for the day, and then actually coming together with people can't be underestimated. The value is, is, is enormous. Thank you for listening to The Hive Podcast with me, Natalie Nahai. To find out more about today's guest and the themes we explored, please visit the show notes page at natalienahai.com forward slash The Hive Podcast. If you've enjoyed the series, please do share it with your friends and give it a rating or review. And for more insights and insider tips, you can join my newsletter as well. My thanks to Caro C for producing. Thank you for listening. And I look forward to sharing more with you in the next episode.